Now, one uh, books to read them, I think uh, they're often struck and surprised uh, straight away by what they find, because these books are not written in the way that ordinary books are. They're not written in continuous prose. They're written in separate paragraphs, and each paragraph is given a number. And very often it's not clear what the relationship is between a paragraph and the other two on either side of it. And usually there isn't much in the way of connected argument either. You get these uh, brilliant metaphors, brilliant examples, brilliant similes, so that the writing is wonderful, and yet it's difficult usually to see what it is he's saying. Now, why did he write like that? Well, several reasons. But uh, first of all, I do want to say I entirely agree with you about the character of the prose, and it is both entrancing and exasperating. I know mm. I felt that when I was uh, preparing for this program. I went and reread acres of mm. Wittgenstein, and there just is a huge amount. And, and it is enthralling. You, you begin to start thinking that way yourself. You begin to address your wife in Wittgensteinian <laughs> aphorisms, which can be very exasperating. For but you also, you have this feeling that when you take up one of these books and, and read it, it's a bit like getting a, a, an, a kit for a model airplane with no instructions as to how you're supposed to put all these pieces together. And that can be extremely frustrating. It's a sort of do-it-yourself book. But why did he write like that? Well, first of all, I think it was the only way he found natural. I mean, he often says what a torture it is for him to try even to put these paragraphs together consecutively, much less to write conventional prose of articles and books. But secondly, I think there is an element almost of arrogance in this. Wittgenstein wanted it to be different from the standard ways of doing philosophy. He hated uh, the sort of standard articles that appear in journals and standard books that are written to be read by undergraduates in philosophy. By the way, he would have uh, hated the kind of thing you are and I are now doing, two professional philosophers discussing his views on television. But he, he did want to be deliberately different from other people. And then there's a, th a third aspect of this is that he honestly and sincerely was struggling to say something new and different. And he always had the feeling that he hadn't said what he really meant, that he was struggling to find a mode of expression and that he never really succeeded. And then lastly, I think we need to say for, for uh, English-speaking uh, uh, viewers that this, though it looks strange to the English eye to uh, see this books written in this way, it's not all that unusual in German. There is a tradition in German philosophy of writing aphoristically. Uh, you see it in Nietzsche, uh, it's in Schopenhauer, in, uh, Lichtenberg, just to mention a few. And the writing is at its best wonderful. I think we yes. ought to do him the justice of, of saying that. He's a great stylist. As your great yeah. stylist, yeah. and some of the sentences stay in your mind for the rest of your life Forever. After, yes. after you've read them. Yes. In my introduction to this discussion, I mentioned the fact that in the last, I don't, don't know, how long one ought to say, 10 years, 15 years, probably not much more than that, uh, he has become uh, an international figure of importance quite outside philosophy. When one reads books and articles and journalism that have nothing to do with philosophy, one is beginning now over and over again to come across Wittgenstein's name. Can you say just a little about the fields outside mm -hmm. philosophy in which he is important and, and indicate at least what kind of an influence he peer, appears yeah. to be having? Well, at present, I think it's, it's a kind of name dropping. It's an okay name, and he's certainly mentioned in a lot of fields, but I think he would feel himself that he has not been adequately understood, mm -hmm. and indeed has not been adequately understood in philosophy. But some of these fields are uh, literary criticism and aesthetics generally. Wittgenstein is now often referred to, and I think will become more influential. Um, there is a great deal of mention of Wittgenstein in social sciences, particularly anthropology, because he thought of himself as doing a kind of anthropology. Uh, there is a, a, a books written about the importance of Wittgenstein for political theory. So it's what the, the French would call the sciences of man that Wittgenstein has been most influential. Paradoxically, in a way, because he wrote so much about the philosophy of mathematics. But most of his influences now are in outside of philosophy, are in the social And it sciences. seems that the structuralists who are so fashionable, or have been fashionable for so long, seem to be claiming Wittgenstein for their own. Do they well, it's not? the post-structuralists, I think, oh, that probably post, misunderstood the, him the worst. The but that's another yes, program. Yes, yes. Well, right. Well, then, 
then we won't get into that, but I think the point is worth making mm -hmm. that, uh, for example, if you read serious literary criticism now, mm -hmm. you are going to come across constant reference to Wittgenstein. What is your personal evaluation of, 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 of all this, of Wittgenstein as a philosopher? Well, I, actually, I feel so strongly about this that I've been restraining myself all <laughs> along just trying to say what the guy meant and not what I actually think about it. But let me start out negatively, and then I get to end on the, on the more uh, uh, cheerful note. There is a kind of exasperating feature of Wittgenstein that I want to highlight, I want to emphasize, and that is the anti-theoretical bent in Wittgenstein, the idea that we mustn't have a theory, that we can't have a theory of language, we can't have a general theory of language or of the mind. Now, when somebody says to me, when some guy says you can't have a general theory of speech acts or you can't have a general theory of intentionality of how words, or how, the th how thoughts relate to reality, my natural instinct is to go out and write a general theory. We'll just see if we can't have a general theory. And in fact, I have tried to make general uh, 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 statements in both of these fields. I think it's premature of Wittgenstein to say we can't have general theories of language of a philosophical sort or general theories of how the mind functions. We won't know if we don't try. And the, the sheer diversity of the phenomena should not by themselves discourage us. I mean, think of physics. If you think of Niagara Falls and a pot of water boiling and an ice skating rink, it looks like very diverse phenomena. And we could go on and on with the diverse forms that water takes. But in fact, we've now got a pretty good general theory that can account for all of that. And I don't see why we shouldn't seek general theories in philosophy, in, in particular in the philosophy of language and the philosophy of mind. I almost think sometimes that Wittgenstein thought since he had failed to get a general theory, since the Tractatus failed, then any general theory must be impossible. Roughly speaking, if I can't do it, nobody can. And a lot of people... A lot Probably of his, what he actually believed. A lot of his yeah. disciples yeah. have said to me, oh, well, since you reject this anti-theoretical this anti -theoretical bent of the investigation, you must believe in the Tractatus, as if those were the only two options. Yeah. And I want to suggest there are lots of other options. 